Welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us and virtually joining us um, to kick off our first um, presenter in the Kirka Pilot Grants Program Seminar Series. We're so excited to be able to offer to you this over the next few months is um, dissemination of the results of the Pilot Grant awardees from our year one Pilot Grants. Um, so we're just so excited to hear what everybody's been finding in their programs, how the projects actually rolled out and came about. So thank you so much uh, again for joining us and, um, and I'm especially excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jessica Hansen, who is an associate scientist here at the Center for Health Outcomes and Prevention Research. Um, she received her PhD at, in Community and Behavioral Health for, at the School of Public Health from the University of Iowa. Pause for boos or cheers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Dr. Hansen is currently the principal investigator on the NIH funded research studies that use community-based participatory research with American Indian tribes to develop, implement, and evaluate alcohol-exposed pregnancy, or AEP, interventions. For the past 10 years, Dr. Hansen has directed and evaluated uh, multiple projects with American Indian communities focused on maternal child health and published at both qualitative and quantitative data. And I'm so excited to um, help please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Hansen. Thank you very much, Danielle. I did expect a story, so I'm very happy with that introduction. Um, well, I just wanted to start off by saying how pleased I am to be here. You know, I recognize most of the faces in here, obviously, but it's just nice to be able to present your data back to the people that funded it. That doesn't happen very often. You know, often you get, you send reports, you hear nothing back, but this is an opportunity to really disseminate that information. So um, I'm very excited about that. So huge thank yous for being invited to do this. So what I'm going to talk about today, as Danielle said, is my pilot project, and it's kind of very wordy title, but um, it's looking at establishing survey validity and reliability for a program. And I'll explain what validity and reliability are. A lot of you have already heard of that, but I will explain what that is. And this is with a program with American Indian uh, women, with one tribe that I work with. And we had some pretty cool methodologies that we used. We used something called the Think Aloud which I was super excited to um, include in this application. It's something I've, I've wanted to do for a while. And then we also did a test retest. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is the methodology. Um, obviously, I'll talk about the results, because the results are very important. But I do want to highlight the methodology and also what led up to this project. Um, I'll talk about the health topic, why this health topic is so important for the community that I work with, and also why this, uh, this study was so important to them. So I'll be talking about the results, but also I'll be doing uh, kind of an extensive background on the, let's see, it is not moving. I'm getting, there we go, got it. Um, <laughs> so to start off with just the background of the health topic and the intervention. And so alcohol exposed pregnancies, um, the negative health risks associated with prenatal alcohol consumption um, represents a leading cause of disabilities, preventable disabilities in the United States. And so the reason that it's so interesting, along with a lot of other public health issues, is that it's 100% preventable. So something like fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal, anything under the spectrum is completely preventable. So again, like many things in public health, why do people smoke? Why do people not exercise? It's, it's complex. It's not as easy as just black or white, but, but it is 100% preventable. And um, I won't go into defining how you diagnose fetal alcohol syndrome or any of this, anything under the spectrum, but just to give you a, a brief background, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, or FASD, is the continuum, continuum of outcomes of, of individuals that are prenatally exposed to alcohol. And so if you think of something like autism spectrum disorders, it's very similar. So some people are more affected. Um, that would include a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, where you have the typical facial features. Um, but you might have someone who has, uh, is, is a prenatally exposed but doesn't have those facial features. So there's a whole spectrum of that. But it does include the diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, which, which a lot of people are very familiar with. And so the FASD prevalence, I wanted to highlight a recent uh, publication that came out of um, researchers here at Sanford Research from um, the team, including Dr. Amy Elliott and Amy Beatty and Jamie Russo. Um, 
And this was a study in the upper Midwest, and they found rates of fetal alcohol syndrome and actually the entire spectrum, they're substantially higher than previous estimates of FAS. And I had to write down these numbers, I do not have them memorized, um, but the prevalence estimates of FAS vary in the United States. So they're as low as 0.2 to 0.3 per thousand live births, which seems really low. In the study in the upper Midwest, it was as high as 5.9 to 10.2 per thousand. And that was, again, in an upper Midwest city, urban-ish city. It, um, it used two different methodologies, though. Again, I'm not going to go a ton into that, but that kind of may explain the discrepancies in the numbers. What's, why I brought this up and why I think this is really interesting is that this did, was not a reservation-based study. It was in an urban city in Sioux Falls, or in an upper Midwest city of uh, South Dakota. And so it's not... FAS, AEP, it's not just an issue with Native Americans, American Indian communities. But, and I put this quote up here, I, I think Susan wouldn't mind that I put this up here. It's not just an issue with American Indian communities, but, but as she said, it's worth our effort to stop FASD in our nation. And what she's saying there is that we don't really know the prevalence in a lot of communities. We think it's high, we think there's a lot of drinking during pregnancy, but we don't know. But it's still worth the efforts to, to prevent a lot of this because, again, it's 100% of preventable. So I think that quote is a, is a good one from Susan. And prevention can come, of FASD comes in many forms. Um, a lot of previous studies have really focused on working with pregnant women, which makes sense. If a woman's pregnant, you don't want her to drink. Um, this slide highlights a study that we worked on previously that was more community education. So a lot of FASD prevention comes with community education, so educating people on what it is. And this was a community-based project, and they wanted to really talk about, they wanted people to understand what the spectrum of disorders is. And so the question is, which one of these has FASD? Which one has fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? And the answer to the question is they both do. And this is where you're educating on those secondary disabilities. Some people are less affected in terms of what you see physically, but they're still affected. So that was one prevention effort that we worked on previously. But in the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of focus on the preconception time period, so before a woman becomes pregnant. A lot of these efforts come from the CDC. They're leading a lot of these efforts. And the reason they're so concerned about this is, and this statistic is really old, I couldn't find a more updated one, but well, most women, almost all women, stop drinking when they find out they're pregnant. An estimated 130,000 uh, pregnancies in the U.S. are exposed to high levels of alcohol. That's not any level of alcohol, that's high levels of alcohol, so binge drinking. Those numbers probably fluctuate. Those numbers might be actually a little bit low. But what it highlights is the important role of unplanned or unintended pregnancy. We do know that about half of all pregnancies are unplanned, unintended. Um, and what we do know, again, is that most women stop when they find out they're pregnant, but it's that timing of when they find out they're pregnant that's so important. And so people always ask me, how did you end up in fetal alcohol syndrome? And I always think, well, I don't really know. But um, my interest is in women's health. And so my interest is in um, you know, not judging women for the decisions they make, the choices they make, or their behaviors, but try and understand where they're at. Um, so I was very interested in, in this particular study because of that role of unplanned pregnancy, working with women on education, on, you know, how ready are you to have a baby? How ready are you to quit drinking? That sort of thing. So it's, it's really been a great experience. And so I, I, I don't want to say I stole this. I borrowed it from Claire Coles. Um, <laughs> I cited her. Um, but this really shows um, critical periods for fetal development. And if, it's hard to see, I know. That's the best I could get it. Um, but if you look at in terms of weeks of pregnancy, a lot of women find out right, maybe right away at four, they miss their period, four weeks. Some women, eh, six to eight weeks. And you can see where uh, fetal development, what is happening at that point. And that's why, if a, again, if a woman continues drinking alcohol, especially at heavy levels, it's, it's concerning. Um, yeah, so if you want to copy this chart, the, the citation is at the bottom, but I think it's really neat. I, I couldn't, I didn't want to bring up copies of this article for everybody, but if you want to see it, it's a really great, um, <clears throat> it highlights uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is from 1992, so kind of old. But this is a quote from a woman um, who had a baby born with full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. And she wrote about the guilt she felt. But she also wrote, um, and she, yeah, 
I was drinking a bottle of vodka a day that December, so um, during a month long period. She was so out of touch that I didn't even know I was two months pregnant. When I found out, I quit there and then, but the damage was done. So again, she quit the second she found out she was pregnant, but it was up to that point that she was drinking at very heavy levels. Um, and again, that's why that preconception period for us is so important. All right, so now we'll get into the health intervention that, um, that we work with. It's called Project Choices. And I do have the acronym. It's Changing High Risk Alcohol Use and Increasing Contraceptive Effectiveness Study, which is a mouthful, so we just call it Choices. But this is a huge effort that was undertaken by the CDC to um, reduce risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. Um, it uses, uses something called motivational interviewing, which a lot of people are very familiar with. Um, it's self-guided change. People are, um, we meet them where they're at. You know, what do they want to change? What goals do they have? What behaviors do they want to change? But this original choices study um, was tested through a randomized controlled trial, so very thoroughly tested. It was non-pregnant women from various settings in three southern states, urban settings, I should say, in three southern states. And they met with an, interve an, ugh, an interventionist four times. And there were various types of activities, um, discussions with the woman. And it did include a separate contraceptive counseling session. Uh, overall, the, the choices intervention significantly decreased risk for alcohol-exposed pregnancy. Now, people always ask me, well, why? How does it work? They don't know that. They don't know how it works. Is it the use of motivational interviewing? Is it just that first step to talking with someone about this issue of learning about sort of that, that risk that you can have? They really don't know that yet. And again, that's been 20 years, 15 years, I guess, since they published this information. So and it's a really good question, but they know it works. Um, and in this population, so what they're focused on, there's two ways to prevent alcohol-exposed pregnancy. You can either reduce drinking if you're at risk for pregnancy. So let's say one comes in and says, I am not going to quit drinking. It's my favorite thing to do. I'm not going to do it. Okay, that's her decision to make, and, and we definitely want to, um, if she's open to discussing that, we want to discuss it with her. But is she open to talking about birth control? Um, if she says, oh, I just, I, I hate birth control. It's, I don't like the hormones. I don't like this. I don't like that oh, can we talk about reducing drinking? So we're trying to meet her where she's at. And in the original choices intervention, most women, the majority of women, reduce or change both. Um, they reduced their drinking and they got on contraception. All right, so now we're getting to more local efforts. And as I said before, um, the tribe was very interested in this program and very open to this program. I don't know if I introduced this at Sanford, if they would be as open. I don't know. But the tribe was very passionate about this intervention. And so when I say the tribe, I'm talking about the Oglala Sioux Tribe, which is also called the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, it's a fairly large uh, geographic area. There's approximately, and I stress approximately, um, 40,000 people that live there. That's from one statistic. You might find different statistics otherwise. But it's very rural, um, large um, distances between towns. There's Indian Health Service provides health care there, um, but there's not a lot of other services. So, but anyways, the tribe was very open to this. They were very interested in this. And um, their interest started with a project, again, that Amy and I worked on, Amy Elliott and I worked on, where we just were looking at the risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. Now, this involved an intervention that we did. I won't get into that. But what we found is that American Indian women were at risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy. So you can see listed here um, the rates of drinking, were binge, technically binge drinking levels. And then 30%, again, that bottom bullet, indicated they used no protection while they were sexually active. When I was practicing this presentation the other day, one of the people that I was practicing in front of said, well, you need to be careful because it's not that 30% are going to have a baby exposed to alcohol. No, but they're at risk. So I think that's important to stress. They're at risk. They have a chance. Um, and that 30% is actually very, a little higher, but fairly similar to national rates. So nationally, about 10 to 26% of women are at risk for an alcohol-exposed pregnancy, again, because of high drinking levels, and they're not protecting against pregnancy. And so the Oglala Sioux Tribe took that information 
and they applied to the Indian Health Service, some funding for, from Indian Health Service, and they piloted the Choices Intervention. Now when I say piloted, we spent the first year, year and a half um, modifying materials. Now not modifying the questions, but um, adding pictures, the formatting we changed a little bit. Um, we had to go through quite a bit of um, approval processes, but we got the input from, from the clinics, and we worked with two sites, one in Rapid City and then one in Kyle. And we began piloting, and that was a three-year process. And what it really showed us is that the tribe is open to this. Um, they were very interested in the use of birth control. That was a concern that I had, is that we were going to face a lot of roadblocks, and we did not, um, in general, face those roadblocks. And so it was implemented. The only issue, and again, this is leading up to the pilot project that I submitted to Kirka, was was while this project was successfully implemented, we had our interventionist running, we were getting some data, we had several issues with um, data quality concerns. So we had our interventionists calling us or emailing us saying, this girl doesn't get it. What does this question mean? How can I reword it so she understands it? Can I do that, first of all? Um, they were confused with certain components, again, of the questions. So what we had changed in that pilot project was we added pictures, we made it more user friendly, we looked at the readability, we added local statistics, but the survey measurements we did not change. And, and that obviously was shown to be a problem. So one interventionist in particular um, contacted me and said, we, this is not working. And so I was at a meeting with some choices experts. Um, these were the people, the original PIs on this original choices study, and I brought this up. And it was a, a bit contentious. I mean, I was, they felt I was criticizing um, their survey measurements, which I was not, um, but they really cautioned against changing them because they felt it would um, reduce the validity of the survey measurements. So of course that made me just determined to change <laughs> the, the survey question. So, um, and that led to this application. And so I want to emphasize that the OST Choices program was the first of its kind with American Indian women. So it wasn't that Choices wasn't used before with like natives, but this was a tribal program, it was locally funded, um, it was in clinics, and, and this has been replicated now in, in Wisconsin and Colorado, but this was the first of its kind. And so we really felt that some of those measurements were not written appropriately for readability or clarity. Women were not, some women were not understanding these questions. So we felt, well, it's really crucial to, ter to determine that validity, which again, I'll define, but it's accuracy and measurement, and then also the reliability. All right. So validity, I had to get on, look at my grant to see what I wrote in my grant, but validity determines what survey questions to use. And so we're really, as researchers, we, we really need to know that the question is truly measuring the, the behavior of importance. Is what we're asking getting at what we mean? That's important as researchers. Does the survey measure intend to, is it, does it measure what it is intended to measure? And then reliability is the reproducibility. Um, we need consistent results. So obviously in any research study, there's going to be outliers. There's going to be data that's way over here, way under here. There's going to be outliers, but we don't want them all to be outliers. That, that's not good. That means we're not getting at what we need to get. Um, so it's consistency of the measurements, um, consistent results over time. And there's not a lot of studies that look at validity and reliability with um, American Indians. There's some. So there's um, mental health screens, cultural awareness measurements, diet and diabetes prevention. These have been tested. When I say tested, they've, they've undergone validity or liability studies. There's data that shows that. I want to be careful saying that, though, because a lot of sort of more informal validity studies just aren't published. I thought of that when I was putting this presentation together that you know, we do this ourselves all the time. You know, we test out surveys with the people that we work with. So I had a project with um, Kathy Prasik and Jen Prasik on uh, urinary incontinence. And um, we had this survey and one day Kathy said, you know what, Jessica, you, you've got to stop. <laughs> you got to slow down. We need to, to ask women or people in the community what they think of these measures and how we can change these. And so we did that. And we changed them, we modified them slightly. Um, and it wasn't this formal process. We didn't have a grant to do it, basically. So these, this does happen more often than, than is in published uh, literature. And I say that because if you're thinking, oh gosh, 
to get validity in a survey, I've got to do this. I've got to get a year-long grant. I've got to get money. I've got to do this. No. I mean, I was lucky that we have this funding to do this, but it's, it's something that can be much more informal. And so the specific aims of our project, the first was to look at content validity. So we wanted to get um, community members' input. We wanted to get uh, experts' input, looking at the surveys, what did they think of these, asking them to review it. The second thing was to look at um, validity from women who would be eligible for choices. So these were non-pregnant women. They were between certain ages. And this is where we did the think aloud. The, that methodology I'll explain pretty in depth. And then we wanted to look at the reliability by doing a test retest. And that is what it says it is. You give them a survey once, and then two weeks later, you give it to them again. So those were our specific aims. And I guess before I get into any or any um, the methods, are there any questions? That's a lot in the background. And any questions from the people in the webinar? Okay, so our approach was this, a lovely figure. Um, so we wanted community input, input from the content experts, and then uh, additional input from women of childbearing age. And so those were utilized to modify the instruments, modify the questions, and then we wanted to do the test retest. And we're not just doing the test retest on the modified measures, we need to do it on the original measures too. Because if we just did it on the modified measures, it, it's not telling us anything. What if the original measures are like the best questions ever and, and we're missing the boat? So we had to do it with both. And when I see choices measures, this is what I mean. And I'll, I'll show you some examples in just a second. But basically, the initial behavioral assessment, this is where we ask about alcohol use, birth control use. It's not just one or two questions. It's a lot of questions. Um, but we also ask them about temptation and confidence questions. So how tempted they are to drink versus not drink, how confident they are with those same behaviors. And then we ask about readiness to change. How ready are they to change? And these, ex these questions, these exercises, so here's some examples, are very important because, um, especially with a, an intervention that uses MI, because it helps elicit conversation between people, between the interventionist and the woman. So up above, and again, I know it's hard to see, but we're asking about how tempted they are at the present time with certain behaviors. So if, let's say I was asking a woman, so if I were depressed, if she was depressed in general, if everything was going really badly for her, how tempted would she be to drink? So physical discomfort, if I were having trouble sleeping, if I felt jumpy and physically tense, how tempted would you be to drink? But then on the other hand, we would ask about confidence questions to not drink. So, uh, and again, this is a one to five scale. So if I were depressed in general, if everything were going really badly for me, how confident would you be that you, you wouldn't drink? So again, we're getting at um, what, is, what are really triggers for women? So is it being sad about something, if you're anxious? And there's a, it's not just these two. There's a, I think it's like 10 to 15 questions. Um, these are just two that I pulled out. But we're trying to get at what triggers women to drink. And we have those uh, similar questions for birth control use. Not unpleasant, not depressed, but <laughs> similar situations where a woman might not use birth control. If I don't know anything about it, if my partner gets angry when I use birth control, how confident would you be that you could still use it? Again, we're getting at um, things in a woman's life that are real to them. So having a partner angry with them is not a good feeling. And so how much, how confident would they be that they could then change their behaviors and use contraception? The question on the bottom is the readiness ruler. Um, and that's a 1 to 10 scale, how important, let's say, something is to them. So how important is it to drink below risky levels? We also ask not just importance, but how sure they are and how ready they are. So even if a woman says, it's very important, 10, I want to stop drinking. But if she says, mm, I'm like a five, I don't think, I'm not ready to do it. I want to do it, but I'm not ready to do it. That will elicit conversation. What has to happen for her to become ready? So these are all very important parts of choices of the intervention and the activities that we use. Um, because this, again, is really where the counselor gets more information from the woman and can provide her with feedback and, and can elicit some some change talk is what we really want to do. So these are the origin, how they were written originally. And these were some of the problems we had. So when I explain it to you, it, it makes sense, kind of. 
but uh, the women we were working with did not necessarily understand it. And so what we wanted to do is we got um, community members and experts in the field for specific game one. So these were individuals that, um, again, community members within the tribe, but also people that worked with Native Americans and also people that worked with fetal alcohol syndrome. And so um, I also had one of the original choices PIs review some of this. So what we did is we sent them paper copies of these measures and we asked them to thoroughly review it. Now this can be pretty arduous, it's not fun. I, well, I think it would be fun, but some, I mean it, it is kind of a long process. And so we're looking at um, their opinions, problems. What ideas, how would they change it in an ideal world? And then we, they sent that information back to us. So the Think Aloud, I'm gonna go into a little bit more in depth. This basically is where um, pe uh, participants, people verbalize their thoughts when completing a survey or completing an activity. And um, again, when I was practicing this presentation, I kept thinking, this is hard. I don't know how our project assistant did this because it's, it's hard to do. I mean, if I gave someone a survey and said, okay, there's the survey, now as you're answering it, just think aloud and I'm just gonna sit here and watch you and take notes and you know, pretend I'm not here. So it's not an easy methodology, which is why it takes a, a certain type of person to do it. Um, but it, it's really an important way to collect information about how people are responding, why they're responding certain ways, um, critical thinking, and areas they're having problems with. Um, this methodology has been used for things like how people choose what foods to buy, why people choose to buy unhealthy foods. Um, but also survey measurements, so getting feedback on surveys, like when they respond to a question, um, this isn't up here, but the importance question. So if you go back here, the one on the bottom, the readiness ruler. So how important, so if I was, let's say I was doing this, so how important it is for me to drink below risky levels? Okay, well, you know, I'm, I don't know, I, I have to work every day, I gotta be there by eight, you know, I don't wanna be hungover, so it's pretty important to me, I'll say a nine. How sure are you? Well, that's how I relax at the end of a long day. I don't know, like a one, whatever. I mean, so that's how it would ideally go where a person is just thinking aloud as they're speaking. Why I came to that decision to answer that way. And so for our methodology, we did that. So we had a project assistant who would meet with our participants and give them a choices questionnaire. She'd explain the process pretty extensively and just have them start. Um, it, we did decide if they paused for pretty long, um, we just reminded them sort of, why don't you just keep thinking out loud, keep telling me what you're thinking. We tried to keep that to a minimum. Um, we tried not to do that because that kind of interferes with people's thinking. But again, it's not a natural process as you're thinking to, well for some people it is, but for most people it's not a natural process to think as, as they're answering questions. We did have some participants, not a ton, but some that were hesitant, they did not like this at all. They didn't want to do this. And that was okay. Um, so what we decided to do was that um, we asked them at the end of each question what they were thinking when they answered that question. Now again, that's not traditional think aloud. That's not what you're supposed to do. But that was the best way we could get the information um, back from them. And then at the end, the project assistant would ask, um, she was taking notes throughout. She would ask them, okay, did I, is this what I heard you say? Is this correct? And she would repeat back to them what she had heard and they could clarify as needed. We did audio tape them with permission and um, the project assistant took thorough notes. A lot of times with think alouds they do kind of a traditional content analysis where you, you record, you transcribe verbatim, and then you code. And we decided not to do that. Um, we did something called a script analysis and so the project assistant listened so she would have take a blank survey. She had her notes but then she would take a blank survey for each participant and she would listen to the recordings and she would, she would write. She would physically write down, okay, she didn't understand this question, she really struggled with this word, she, wanted, she didn't know what this meant, that sort of thing. And so she was very thorough about that. Um, and this is an acceptable way to analyze think alouds, I should say that. A lot of times they stress the traditional qualitative analysis, but I had enough citations that said this was fine, so I felt good that we were doing it that way. Um, notes were given to the PI, moi, um, and I created a spreadsheet that just looked at for each question. We looked at changes, problems, confusion. So this 
Excel spreadsheet was long, and it was, it was a lot of information. <clears throat> what was interesting, though, is that there were themes. So again, this was pretty qualitative. I mean, people are speaking out loud. It's very qualitative. And there were themes. So I was able to kind of pare down the, the Excel spreadsheet a bit. And um, to come to a, a final conclusion how we want to modify these, we had a larger conference call or a conference call with a larger group. So that was the choices interventionist, the choices coordinator, um, my RA Jamie, the project assistant Cindy, myself, um, the co-PI Georgiana. We all got together and we looked, again, word question by question. And so that was a pretty long conference call. Um, but we really came to consensus, like this is what needs to change. This is what the women are telling us needs to change. And again, what the input that we're getting from these experts and community members are saying. And so after we're done with all that, we went back to the, our content experts and our community members and we said, would you be willing to re-review this, this modified version? And they did, and they didn't have any additional problems with that. So we felt like, okay, we got our modified version. Let's go to specific game three. And this is where we wanted to compare the new version with the original version. And I kind of think of it this way, that I want to show those choices, PIs, that mine's better. Um, kind of proving them wrong. But, but this is really a good methodology to use. Um, and what we did is we had um, the project assistant, Cindy, would set up a table like in the lobby of a uh, health clinic. And any woman who was, again, age eligible, 18 to 44, would come up and um, she'd be randomly assigned to either complete the modified version or um, the original version. Easy peasy, they, would, they were given a $10 gift card. Cindy would then call them two weeks later, say, I'm coming back in two days, you know, I'm gonna be in the same location, come back and you'll get an additional $15 gift card if you complete this, the, the retest, the second survey. And what we found, um, oh, I should say the analysis was done by the Kirkham Methodology Group and I have to uh, say thank you so much because that was very, very helpful. Okay, now I'll get into the results. So we got feedback from 17 individuals locally and nationally. This is for a uh, specific game one, the content analysis. And these represented tribal health centers, health professionals locally. Um, we had people who, works, who work with uh, other Native American groups, like a, a woman who works in FAS in, with tribes in California. She reviewed these. It was great. I mean, I felt very, um, I just felt very lucky that, that we had all these connections with people that worked with, with American Indians and worked with the health topic. So great feedback from those folks. And then the Think Aloud, we had 23 Native women participate, and these were from a variety of communities. So we didn't want just women from Pine Ridge or Rapid City. We got some from Pine Ridge and Rapid City, but then we um, really focused our efforts on, let's get women from some of those outlying districts. And so, these numbers here, we had, women from Manderson, Kyle, Porcupine, and Interior. So Cindy did a great job trying to get people from a variety of, of locations. Because we, we did want it to be pretty representative of the women from the whole tribe. And these were some of the changes that they suggested. And again, these were themes. There weren't a lot of like, oh, you need to throw it all away and start over. There was none of that. But there were just things like wording changes. So one of the questions talks about, um, if I were depressed, how tempted would you be to drink? And that word depressed is a huge red flag. Like, what do you mean depressed? What does that mean? Like clinically depressed, just sad? And so that needed to be uh, clarified, changed a little bit. Um, adding context to questions, what does physically tense mean? Now, when I think physically tense, I think like, I've just worked out and I'm like all sore. Some people it's more, um, you're anxious. So again, it means different things. We need context to those questions. Another thing, and I thought I had done such a good job on this um, with the original choices when we modified was, okay, we've got all the types of birth control on there that, that are available and the drink size. We've got it. We did not have it. Um, what they really wanted were pictures of what women are drinking, and we did not have that on there. We had, this is a drink size, but they wanted, the, they wanted to see it. It, it wasn't just that it was written down, they wanted to see it. Um, and some of the questions in the layout um, were confusing. So these, in my opinion, my professional opinion, 
the changes we made were not groundbreaking. They were not, oh God, we changed the whole validity of this question, like it's not gonna mean anything now. They were very minor. It didn't change the meaning of the question. And I feel like this process had to happen. These questions were not created for Native American women from rural South Dakota. They, these questions were used with rur or urban women from southern states, completely different population. So for us, um, I think this was a great project. So here's some examples of the changes we made. If you look above the old temptation questions, if I were depressed in general, if things were going badly for me, and how we changed it was word for word, how tempted would you be to drink alcohol if you were feeling stressed, upset, or down? It's not really changing the meaning, but it's asking the same thing, but in a way that people understood better, in my opinion, in my professional opinion. Um, another one below, if I started to believe that alcohol was no longer a problem for me, they didn't know what that meant. Like, what does that mean? Like, even if someone's binge drinking, they may not think drinking is a problem for them. It's not a problem. Um, so we did change it a little bit to include sort of those binge drinking definitions. And then the pictures below are ones that we added. We added pictures of Mike Harder lemonade. It's not Mike's hard lemonade, Mike's Harder lemonade. And then uh, juice. Again, these are what's, what uh, the people that we work with, what they were drinking. And, and this is what they, when they go out and, and let's say go to a party, this is what they see. And so, again, making it more visual. All right, for specific inquiry, so we did the test retest with the original and modified. Uh, we had 44 women complete the modified and 35 complete the original. We didn't quite meet our goal, but I was pretty happy with these numbers. Um, for the retest, we had about a 50% retest compliance rate. Again, it would have been so great if we would have had a, even a 70%, but again, um, it, this was a pilot project and we felt like, okay, let's, let's see what we, can, what we see. And um, after the analysis that the Kirka team did, what we found, and this is really interesting, we only found a couple of significant findings. One was that for the alcohol questions, the temptation and confidence alcohol questions, the modified version performed better. And what that means is that the modified version was better. Um, that, that <laughs> Not that it's a competition, no. But that the modified version just worked, was more understandable to the women when they did the retest. Um, but for the contraception questions, the original questions were better. Now, I've kind of gone back and forth about this. We did draft a publication, and I thought, I have to address this. What does this mean? This is so interesting. Um, and I even wrote down, what does this mean in capital letters on my notes? What this really means to us is maybe the alcohol questions originally were more confusing. Maybe alcohol questions in general are more confusing. We're asking about drink size, how much they're drinking. Uh, contraception maybe seems more black and white. I don't know. I, maybe this would be another Kirkwood Pilot project. I don't know, but, um, but that's what we found. Uh, there were no other significant differences. And so differences in the readiness rulers, we had our modified version, we had our original one, there weren't any differences. So what that left us with is, so what do we do with that? How do we modify something if, if, it's not, if the entire modified survey is not performing better? What do we do? Um, so we went back and met with the group. We, there were some questions that were better and that the interventionists liked better. So we continued to get feedback from an interventionist. It wasn't like I was sitting here thinking, ah, oh, we'll just do this and see what happens. We got a lot of feedback from the coordinator and the interventionist. So with the ones that, um, that didn't, there was no real difference. We really left it up to the sites. Like, here's the original one, here's the new one, what do you think? And really left it up to them how they wanted it to look. And so now we have new survey measurements. Um, we have not had any more calls about confusing questions. Now that's not saying, again, that what we have now is perfect. We're lucky enough with our intervention that we're able to modify these surveys, that we don't have our funding agency saying, oh no, you have to leave it this way. So we are lucky in that way, and that's not always possible with interventions. You have to use a certain measurement in a certain way. Um, but, but we're able to modify it, and so we're very lucky that way. And so now they have a modified version of the modified version, I like to say, because what we did the test retest on, it's not exactly what they're currently using. But I think overall, sort of to wrap everything up, this entire process was a really neat process. 
And it's definitely one to be done before data collection begins because people ask me, so how does this impact the, the results from your pilot study? And I think, oh, I don't, I don't really want to talk about that right now because it's a very good question. Um, we, we're still using that data in our reports, but, but it is something to keep in mind that you want to do this before data collection begins. And again, it's not something that I feel has to be done in such a rigorous manner. It can be as easy as sitting down with a group of elder women and saying, what do you guys think of this question? Do you mind just looking at this a little bit? And again, we're all doing that. If you're utilizing CBPR, you're probably already doing that. I think the Think Aloud methodology, we did find definite themes. This is probably one that I would use again. I think it was just a really neat way to get feedback from people. Um, and I think it adds to the literature on Think Alouds too. And so, in all, we did find uh, evidence that certain components should be modified, which I think, again, that was our aim. Is this survey asking what it is intended to? And in some ways it is, and in some ways it wasn't. And so we were able to modify it based on our need. I do want to point out just some limitations, because that's a part of any good presenter or publication, is that, um, and again, with the Think Aloud, just having that project assistant sitting there um, is probably a limitation. Imagine you know, having someone just watching you complete a survey. It's, it's probably fairly intimidating. So that's a little bit of a limitation. Um, and also that what we did was just with one program in one community, or one, uh, one tribe. And so it's not like <clears throat> I could take this survey and go to another tribe and say, here you go. All done. I mean, it would. This process probably they'd need to look over the questions again. It's something that I think it's always valuable to get continuing input on, if that's possible for your program. And so I wanted to end by bragging a little bit about all the great things that the OST Choices program is doing. Um, so we we didn't just do the pilot project and then we're done and then, you know, we kind of all move on. We're continuing to. Um, add things to the Choices program. So if you look at the very top, that's all the staff that work on, currently work on the Choices program. Um, Susan Poirier is the coordinator. So she runs, she's like the face of Choices and is, does stuff with budgets. She has energy I will never have. Um, the interventionist in Pine Ridge is Jackie Jacobs-Knight and Kyle Katana. Jackson and Christina Janice. And note that uh, Chris, or Katana and Christina are both Indian Health Service employees and doing this sort of on, in their spare time. And so, um, so we've really integrated it as part of a clinic, which again was po the point of the pilot project. So that's still running, which is really great. And then in Rapid City, we're very lucky to work with Jessica Gromer and Amy Willman. And so you can see down there, sort of on the bottom a little bit, what, what they're all doing. And in Pine Ridge, they're doing um, the individual choices. Again, that's the uh, original four sessions, or two sessions or four sessions. But now what we're doing is we're trying out group choices. And we have some funding, you can't see it, it's way down there, but we have some funding from NIMHD to test that out. And so where we're at right now is we're testing group choices. And it's been, it's gone really well. So um, better, more things to come. So I'm very excited, I'll be adding hopefully to the slide very soon. So in addition to those folks, I did want to acknowledge Georgiana Wilton. She was my co-PI. She's at the University of Wisconsin. And she is uh, doing very similar things with tribes in Wisconsin, and so has been a great partner. At Sanford Research here, Cindy Hauge was our project assistant um, and did an amazing job with data collection. Very organized, was just wonderful. I didn't mention Jamie. She's um, the senior research associate on the project. And then we worked with Susan Pumla and Katie Burgess from Kirka, also Chopper, who did the analysis. So I just wanted to thank all um, Kirka folks for all the, not just the funding, but the input, the grant help, um, you know, the entire grant process. It was such a breeze. So thank you very much. And that's it. And I will open it up for any questions that folks have. Yes, Amy. Um, how, with the birth control, I, on a tribe, how often is that used and do you think that the, um, the use of that or the, the prevalence of use of it could have played a role in how it was interpreted in the survey? Yeah, so what you're asking, I think what you're asking is so, um, 
how much women are using contraception and how much they know about contraception and maybe that impact of the survey results. I think that's, actually that should go into the, the article. I think that's a really good point. What we found, and this is again is just anecdotal, um, that a lot of women who come in to our choices, who enroll in choices, really don't have a lot of experience with contraception. They've never been on it. They don't know much about it. Um, they're very open to it, but yeah, they, they don't have necessarily that experience. I think that's a very good thought. Um, it's not something that impacts them as much. They don't have as much, um, they don't think about it a lot because it's not a part of their regular lives. So that's a very good point. And again, it should have gone in the publication. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, Liz. That's a good question. So the feedback we got from the content analysis and the think aloud was actually pretty similar. I think of that depression, um, the word depression especially, because a lot of people from both the community, the experts, but then also through the think aloud said, you can't use this word. This is not a good word to use. You need to use something else, that sort of thing. It was similar. I mean, the feedback we got was a little more in depth from the content analysis because they were sitting down. I wasn't watching them as they did this. They were sitting down and physically writing on the survey what they thought of each question. So it was more in depth, but I would say um, very similar. Like you, you could, should change this. What about the formatting? Is this drink so, is is this what people are drinking? That sort of thing. So it's a good question. Yes. Can you just talk real briefly about what when you took your results back to the CDC or the original, you know, um, creators of the intervention? Like with the modified version? Correct. Well, that is not prime time yet, so that has not been published, and so I haven't communicated that back to them. Oh, yeah. um, one of the original Choices PIs, Karen Ingersoll, did review. She knew I was doing this project, but I didn't really. The, the person that had the most problem with this type of study, I have not communicated that with, and I think she would think this is the worst thing ever, to be honest with you. So, um, But I will gladly send them a copy of the when it's published, like send them a copy of that. Um, I think it's interesting, but I don't know that they'd agree with the results. So, yes? Has this been, have you seen this done with any other um, groups or any other samples? Like have they done a similar thing with the choices at all, made any modifications? And if not, do you think any of the findings that you have here are generali generalizable or do you think that well, what makes sense? I know Georgiana and the folks in Colorado did a more informal sort of review process. So they had, they have key stakeholders who review surveys and um, booklets and this. They didn't have anything this in depth and intense, no. Um, but again, they're still doing similar things because they're still getting input from the community. More so than, again, I thought we had gotten so much input but we didn't get enough type thing. Um, in terms of other sites, not that I know of. I mean, most other sites, as far as I know, use the original choices materials. Like, um, and you can, there's a link down there. You can, they're free. You can get them. Anyone can use them. Um, but not really. I mean, and this is being used, choices is being used, you know, in a lot of different communities, Canada, internationally. And so there are changes. But again, I don't think it's been this in depth. This was a helpful process for us, but I don't know that a lot of people would find this necessary. Um, let's say they're working with women in southern states, they probably don't need to do this, so. Yeah. How about the think aloud model? Is that something that, I guess, to me, whenever I've been a participant in a study and somebody's read the questions aloud, I always want to comment about, like, my thoughts this on is that terrible. question, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> oh, that's a funny way to say that, and I, I think I respond to it that way, but nobody does ever take down the information mm -hmm. I think that would just be a consistent, like, it would be good to have that data for any tool out yeah. there. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the only concern with that is that you start getting so much information. Like, let's say you did this with 50 women and they all had different things to say and different things they reacted to. You can't change 50 things, especially if they contradict each other. Um, so I, I, I think it's valuable. Um, I remember when you said that, I thought of when I did my thesis, this was to college students, and I had people write on my survey, like, this is a terrible question. And that was fine, um, but, but it was, wasn't something that was helpful to me. Um, so I think it can be valuable if it's helpful. Like, 
you know, could you just add like an example right here? Something like that I think is easy. Um, but if you say this is, you need to not ask it this way. That's where you get into issues. And this again is what the choices folks were saying. You get into issues of you're changing the entire meaning of the question. You have to be careful about that. I don't think we did that. I don't think we changed the meaning of the questions at all. But when you start getting so much input, you risk that I think a little bit, so. Any other questions? Were there any questions on the webinar? Okay. For folks on the webinar. There's a question from the webinar here. It okay. says, what are your thoughts with respect to the next grant writing steps for your project? Oh, wow. And at what point <laughs> in your grant do you, did, did you receive the R24? That's a good question. Um, so we got the R24, I think it was in 2013. So we started writing that right as the pilot project was ending. The R24 was meant to expand choices. So we, ha we implemented it in clinics. What can, how can we expand it? And that's why we're looking at that group choices. Our next steps, I don't know if I should give my secrets away, but um, just kidding. What we want to do is we want to test group choices versus individual choices. And so what the sites are doing now is they put women wherever. Like, oh, I got enough women for a group, they have a group. Oh, this woman just came in by herself, I'll just do individual. And so what we want to do is randomize people to the group versus individual and really look at how does that, I mean, is one better over the other? How is it impacted by demographics, by age? What's interesting with group choices is that our interventionists, and again, we haven't had a ton, it's anecdotal information, but they say we cannot have older women in group choices. And I always ask, what do you mean older women? Like over 35, so yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, but, but they really feel like the younger women, if it's a group of younger women, that group goes so well. And if you add an older woman in there, it does not go well. These aren't uh, necessarily elder women, they're just older, they're in their, they've experienced life, they, they, their kids are gone, like they're graduated, whatever. Um, so that's something that I think is really interesting. We want to test out, by, again, by demographics. Um, we also want to look at that idea of social support. So within groups, we really feel like women make a connection with other women. They have that support person to, oh, I didn't hear about that type of birth control. What, what did you hear about it? Um, although that's a risk for misinformation being exchanged. But um, So we also want to include social support. How can we include the community within choices? Because right now, again, it's women at risk for an alcohol exposed pregnancy and the interventionist. But how can we include grandmas, aunties, sisters, partners, whatever. Um, that's really where we want to take that. I think that's, yeah, a good question. So we also are looking at, how would this look in like teenagers? Oh gosh, I've never worked with teenagers before. I mean, I've worked with them, like I've met teenagers, but I've never had a project with teenagers. And so I think, and Choices has never been tested with teenagers either. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. How would it work with teenagers? So I think there's a lot, with choices, there's, I, again, I'm passionate about the health topic. I love this intervention because um, it, it, it's non-judgmental. It, it reaches a woman where she's at. Um, it's women's health. I love it. Um, but I really feel like there's so much room to grow with this intervention and um, things to add, things to test. I said before, they don't know why choices works. Is it the MI? Is it they're just... They're being asked these questions. They're able to make their own behavior change. They don't know why. And I think as more and more research happens, um, they'll uncover those questions, hopefully. So, other questions? Yes. So, is that it? I think We're so. We're done. Yes. Thank you.